Hello, and welcome to Scripture Untangled, a podcast by the Canadian Bible Society. My name is Joanna LaFleur. I'm a friend of the Canadian Bible Society, and I'm going to be your guide for today's episode. Today, we join veteran journalist Lorna Duick as she interviews Reverend Dr. Andrew Bennett, who is Program Director at CARDIS, and Reverend Dr. Andrew Sterling, who is Ambassador for the Canadian Bible Society. And this is an insightful discussion about the beliefs of Canadian Christians. In this discussion, they explore the findings from a February 2024 survey conducted by CARDIS in partnership with the Angus Reid Institute and supported by the Canadian Bible Society. In this interview, the guests dive deep into the survey results and discuss key questions like, what do Canadian Christians believe about their faith and how do they practice and live it out publicly? Cardis is a nonpartisan Canadian think tank, and for nearly 25 years, Cardis's passion has been to promote the understanding of Canadian freedom of religion and place of religion in public life. The author of the survey, Reverend Dr. Andrew Bennett, holds a PhD in politics from the University of Edinburgh and is a program director at Cardis Faith Communities. In this discussion with CBS Ambassador Reverend Dr. Sterling, you can find out more about this research, but also if you want to learn more about the guests themselves, it will be in the show notes for today's episode. So join us now as we explore these findings of how Canadians consider the Bible. CARDIS, a nonpartisan Canadian think tank and the Canadian Bible Society, have partnered together to produce an insightful new survey on what Canadians believe about the Christian faith. And it is titled, Still Christian? Question mark. We are joined by the author, Dr. Andrew Bennett and Reverend Dr. Andrew Sterling to uh, discuss the findings of this important new survey. And the author of this survey is Reverend Dr. Andrew Bennett. He holds a PhD in politics from the University of Edinburgh. He has degrees in history from McGill and Dalhousie, and he is the program director for Cardis Faith Communities. Cardis's passion is to promote the understanding of Canadian freedom of religion and place of religion in public life. They're heading into their 25th year of doing Doing that in Canada. And Still Christian was also carefully watched and coached along by CBS Ambassador Reverend Dr. Andrew Sterling. He began the ambassador role after 23 years as senior minister of Timothy Eaton Memorial Church, where his sermons on the Bible were broadcast and printed each week. They were presented in Sundays in church, and his passionate role has been to increase the knowledge of the Bible in Canada, which he now does by helping build relationships with churches, academic institutions, individuals, and Christian leadership in Canada. He is a dear leader here at the Canadian Bible Society, and so join us now as we explore these findings of how Canadians believe about the truths of Holy Scripture. Still Christian. Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. Reverend Bennett, you've authored this study. This has not been asked before. These questions have not been asked before. Tell us why it was so important to find out what Canadian Christians are believing. Well, thanks very much, Lorna. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about this important survey. We did this in partnership, as you mentioned, with the Canadian Bible Society and also with our survey partner, the Angus Reid Institute. And uh, Angus Reed is an actual person, and he's a, he's a faithful Christian, and we've had a partnership with, with he and his institute for some time. And he's also passionate about how do Canadians engage with religious faith. And this is probably the 12th survey we have done in partnership with the Angus Reed Institute to explore these questions. But you know, to your point, uh, to my knowledge, these type of questions had never been asked in this way in Canada. So we wanted to get a better sense of what do Canadian Christians actually believe. And so we posed 20 statements and we asked respondents to agree or disagree somewhat or strongly with those statements. And the statements run the gamut from doctrinal positions, what we might call mere Christianity, just basic Christian beliefs, through to moral beliefs and how Christians engage with society. 
and the results uh, are startling. And you've given it uh, a title that has a question mark in it. And Reverend Sterling, as you know, the representative from Bible Society, where your your role is to engage churches mm -hmm. on on belief, biblical belief. Your impression when you realize we have to put a question mark behind the family of Christianity in Canada and, and wonder, are they really understanding Christianity? Well, it's a very thought-provoking question, isn't it? Because there are a few realities that we have at the moment that seem to come out from this report, and we'll talk about these maybe in a little while. But essentially, we're living in a society where Christians are bombarded with many different influences. And so Christians have to ask themselves, in a sense, in every generation, what is it that we really believe? And how can we express that belief in a meaningful way? So you ask the question, and Christians are asking themselves that question. You know, in a sense, are we still really Christian in the light of the barrage that we get of different perspectives and question marks about the Christian faith itself? The second one is that the church as a whole, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking Roman Catholic or evangelical or mainline, which are the three main categories of this report, uh, it doesn't matter which tradition you're from, each of those are living in a time of transition as well. We're moving uh, as a, with our society, with our culture, into a more pluralistic world. We're living in a world with mass media that is available to people to look at and to question the, the faith. Uh, we're living in an age where, in a sense, the Christian consensus, if there ever was really a Christian consensus, but if there was a Christian consensus in general terms, is on the wane. Mm -hmm. And so all of these pressures, in a sense, come to bear upon individual Christians who ask the question, maybe even of themselves, are we Christian? This report is, in a sense, a mirror, just like the scriptural one was, for Christians to look and ask themselves that very question, and how important, though, Lorna, asking that question is in our day and age. And the fact that we've you, you've uh, selected the core essence of what the Christian faith is. So, Reverend Bennett, just explain w the questions that were asked. Sure. And I want to give credit where credit is due here, Lorna. Uh, Lingonier Ministries in the United States has done uh, a survey like this, much more broad than our survey, called the State of Theology Report. And they do that on a biennial basis. And so we had looked at the latest report that they did just a couple of years ago and thought this would be interesting to see whether the Canadian context is any different from, from the U.S. Now we have a smaller survey, um, and I hope that we can repeat this survey maybe with more statements, uh, larger sample size. But I think if there's one thing that I wanted to test in this survey is a question of coherence. Mm. Are Canadian Christians coherent in what they believe? If they state that I am a Roman Catholic, I am an Anglican, I am an evangelical, denominational, non-denominational, do they hold to what that particular tradition believes? Do they hold what is, we might call mere Christianity in the words of C.S. Lewis? Are they holding to that, that understanding? And uh, I had had some sort of working hypotheses over the years of my, my time at Curtis where I wondered, do people in the pews actually believe and practice what they are receiving in church. Uh, the teaching they're receiving, uh, you know, the whole approach that they're, they're getting from their pastors. Uh, do they, is it resonating? How are they being formed? Um, are they living out a coherent faith? And the other issue that comes up, and this is the point I think that Andrew was, was getting at, is we are living in a very pluralist society and it's a society that with that pluralism comes a very high degree of relativism. And so is Christianity just a truth amongst a whole bunch of other competing truths? Or is it what Christians have always held to be true, that it is a truth that is not just a truth, but the truth, and that it is objective and universal? In other words, it is fundamentally and absolutely true. And of course, we understand that Truth in this case is not a philosophy or an ideology that changes with the wind, but rather it's a person, and that's Jesus Christ. And so what are Canadian Christians' engagement 
with the person of Jesus Christ and the church that he established here on earth. And so the unassailable truth um, of the reality of the personhood of Jesus Christ does not fare well in this survey. I, I, I was shocked. Um, and maybe we, sh we, we should just warn our audience, we're going to go through a few of these building blocks, the planks of what the Christian faith is. Let's just go over briefly the, the four key questions that you asked, Andrew. Let's ask that. Right. So if we look at the, the sort of foundational questions, and these are questions that really would go to the very heart of what Christianity is. Mm -hmm. And often in our, in our pluralist society or our relativist society, there's this view that, well, ultimately, all religions believe essentially the same thing. And we asked a question related to that, which maybe we'll get to. But... In, in real fact, that is not true. Only Christianity confesses that God took on human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ for our salvation. Only Christianity confesses that he suffered and died a human death and rose from the dead on the third day. So these are some of the questions we wanted to get at. So the first question we, the first statement I should say that we posed was agree or disagree, God is all powerful and all knowing and cannot make a mistake. The second question or statement, agree or disagree, there is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Then we asked, agree or disagree, all religions including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are equally true. And then the question that really gets to the heart of who is Jesus Christ, agree or disagree, Jesus had many roles such as a teacher and prophet, but he was not God. So this is for those who are really keen on church history and, and theological questions. This is the Arian question. Is Jesus Christ fully God and fully man, as uh, Nicene creedal Christians have always professed? Um, so these, these revealed some very interesting results. Well, um, and I think we can put those results up on the percentages up on, on, the, on the screen. This is, these are phenomenally low numbers. Uh, evangelicals, which is, uh, you know, are faring the best. But let's just break down. Uh, Reverend Sterling, what was your big shock value as you saw these kind of numbers? Well, I had shock basically on the person of Jesus himself. This was for me the foundational one. Okay, and, and do we know, mm -hmm. can, we, can we state the percentage here? Yeah, sure. And I, I think it's important to yeah. state from the beginning that when we have on our graph the religiously committed, and then evangelical, mainline Protestant, and Roman Catholic. The religiously committed are all those across the Christian traditions who um, are really involved in their faith. And so these are people who have responded to what we call our spectrum of spirituality, which are basically seven behaviors. And if they're doing all seven of these behaviors, they are what we call the religiously committed. So in that category, we have religiously committed Roman Catholics, mainline Protestants, and evangelicals. So it's a catch-all for the religiously committed. And those would be people who attend services. That's right. So these are people, if we look at our spectrum of spirituality uh, sort of questions, these are people that believe in a God, in God or a higher power. They believe in life after death. They believe that it's important for a parent to raise their children in the faith. They believe uh, that they have an experience of God's presence on a regular basis. They pray to God or a higher power on a regular basis. They regularly read the Bible, and they attend religious services apart from weddings and funerals on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So if someone says, yes, I do all of those seven things, we consider them religiously committed. And that's about 18% of the, of the population. Canadian population. 18%. If, if they're doing none of those things, or maybe one of those things, we consider them not religious. And that's also about 18%, um, if we average it across the surveys we've done. But then when we have the evangelical, the mainline Protestant, and the Roman Catholic, that captures those people who self-identify, that say, yes, I'm a mainline Protestant of some particular denomination, I'm an evangelical of some particular denomination, and I'm Roman Catholic, so they have ticked the box. But they will be across that spectrum. That includes the religiously committed, what we call the privately faithful, who maybe are not reading scripture, maybe not going to church regularly, the spiritually uncertain, these are the seekers. They're doing maybe two or three of those seven things, and they're about 43% of the population. And then also the not religious, who would still call themselves 
mainline Protestant, Catholic, or evangelical. So when we look at that, we have to remember that the religiously committed captures all of those, but because the religiously committed are only 18% of the total number of Christians surveyed, which is around just over 1,000, the sample sizes for religiously committed Catholics, mainline, and evangelicals are fairly small. So uh, they're not statistically really that useful. So that's, that's something to bear in mind as we're looking at these, these numbers. But if we get to this question about who is Jesus Christ, Thankfully, we have amongst the religiously committed, we have uh, roughly um, those who say that, no, actually he is God, who would disagree with the statement that he had many roles such as teacher and prophet but was not God. Uh, we have uh, 70% who would disagree with that. But still, that's 70% of religiously committed. Christians. Mm -hmm. And Andrew, this has been very concerning. Lorna, this has been concerning of me for a long time. Um, Since this is not well in the, in the Christian body yes, in Canada. Yes, absolutely. And let me just give you a little bit of sort of perspective here. I mean, historically, there have been questions about the person of Jesus from the very beginning. Whether or not, in fact, the real question at the beginning was whether or not he was really fully human at all, mm -hmm. or whether he was just sort of a spiritual apparition like the Docetist, that sense that he only appeared to be a man but wasn't fully human. Um, if you subscribe to that belief, um, and there are some who do, uh, they don't maybe articulate it in the same way, but he's sort of another spiritual figure amongst other spiritual figures, but he didn't really come in the flesh in the way that we see him coming in the flesh. Well, the ramifications of that are enormous. I mean, first of all, he wouldn't have been a Jew. Um, he wouldn't be the Messiah um, because he wouldn't have come in the flesh as a person, as a body. He wouldn't be able to identify with us in our suffering, as the book of Hebrews points out. He wouldn't have been a high priest who could, could take away our sins on our behalf because he wouldn't have borne our humanity and wouldn't have physically been present. And he wouldn't have been crucified on a cross. There would have been no physical death. So therefore, there would be no bodily resurrection. So when you simply say, well, he only appeared as a person, the effects of this are enormous. But so too- It starts to just pull out. It pulls it apart. Completely. It's the very same thing when you question the divinity of Jesus, whether he was fully divine. Mm -hmm. And again, that seems to be one of the great questions of our day. Because if he is not divine, then he is, as Andrew was making the comment, one preacher, speaker, prophet amongst many others. Mm -hmm. But if he was the incarnate son of God, which is what our creeds, our faith, and the scriptures say, then if he is that, then he is fully human and he is fully divine. If he is not fully divine, then again, how could he save us from our sins when only God can forgive sins? Mm. That's the big one. How could his crucifixion and death on the cross actually be an act of God's ultimate forgiveness and redemption of the world? If he is not divine, how can he sit at the right hand of the Father and come again and return? So. People sometimes say, Lorna, and you know, I, I have great sympathy for Christians. I, I do. I understand they struggle with these things. But on the other hand, the ramifications of them not adhering in a coherent way with, in a sense, doctrine that has come from scripture and has come from tradition, if you start to walk away from those things, then you lose, in a sense, everything. And therefore, all the other things that we think are really important and valuable in life, the value of life, the value of the human life, the, the, the importance of the sovereignty of God, of the worship of the same God, that God isn't just Father, God isn't just Son, God isn't just Holy Spirit, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then all of these things are, I think, at stake and have an effect on the whole of the Christian witness and why we're in a position, and certainly I'm talking from the mainline Protestant tradition, for many years, I believe these teachings have been eroded. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think this is the major challenge, and Andrew has really given voice to it perfectly. If you have roughly a quarter of religiously committed Christians who are saying, yeah, no, I don't really agree that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. That's the implication here of this, of this statement. Then it raises a very significant question. What are they believing in then? And how have they been formed? And are we letting them down by not giving them a robust Christology that is very clear about who Jesus Christ is? And in some cases, there's also kind of a confusion. If we look at some of the other questions that we'll get to, you find a high percentage, especially of Roman Catholics, who aren't sure what to say, or they'd prefer not to answer. So there's this kind of vagueness about what my belief is. But I think with this particular question, this is so fundamental, yeah. and it cuts across all Christian denominations and churches. There is not a single significant, and I mean significant, Christian denomination that professes the Nicene Creed that does not profess that Christ is fully God and fully man. Not 50-50, but 100% God, 100% man. And I think it's much easier sometimes for people to say, well, he was just this prophet, or he's, he's my friend, or he's, I, I just want the approachable sort of Jesus. But as, as Bishop Robert Barron has said in, in one of his many sort of talks that he gives, if we look at Jesus Christ, he is this somewhat disturbing person because he is fully God and fully man, and because of that, he does certain things that challenge us. And so I think there can sometimes be a bit of, let's call it an implicit Arianism, where people shy away from that divine aspect of Christ because maybe it's a little bit easier to accept what he's demanding of us. And I think this is a major challenge for the churches today. Wow. If I could just pick up on that, Lorna, because Andrew's really on to a point here. The danger of not ascribing one's faith to the full humanity and divinity of Jesus is that Jesus becomes an amorphous person, um, subject, in a sense, to our own whim, uh, to our own creation. Uh, we can make him an idol, believe it or not, but an idol of our own making and one that we worship, but we worship on our terms. And rather than the Jesus of history, um, the Jesus is revealed in scripture, and the Jesus is attested to by the apostles as fully human and fully divine. So I think the real danger is, which Jesus are we talking about? I run into people all the time, Lorna, who will tell me, oh yeah, 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 I love Jesus, I like Jesus, I'm a Jesus person. But when you actually start talking to them at some depth about that, um, it becomes very much, and I have a good, as you said, Andrew, I love it, you know, I have a really good friend and his name is Jesus, and he is with me all the time, but he's not raised from the dead, and I'm thinking, okay, how can he be with you all the time if he's not raised from the dead? You know, it, it, it's, and yet they don't believe in the resurrection. So they, they make their Jesus in their own image, and a Jesus who is acceptable to whatever cultural norms, whatever values they may have themselves, but not one that has the concreteness, you yeah. know, of the incarnation. Yeah, and, and when you think of the real life issues we face every day, whether it's forgiveness, whether it's trust and provision, whether it's love for neighbor, if you take out the authority that Jesus is supernatural, is God. All, and, and, and I know that this is part of the concern is that why you put the question mark in there. Are we still Christian mm -hmm. then if we don't have that authority in the divinity of Christ for that? Um, Reverend Bennett, let's, let's pick up this. So that's a great coverage of Jesus. The second question, belief that uh, all religions are equally true. So we asked a, a version of this question in our earlier study on the Bible and how Canadian Christians relate to the Bible. And in that survey, we asked, agree or disagree, the scriptures of all major world religions teach essentially the same things. And to that statement, back in 2022, 68% of Roman Catholics agreed, 65% of mainline Protestants agreed, and over a third of evangelicals agreed with that statement. 
Now again, bearing in mind that no other scripture or set of scriptural texts, and here we're talking about the New Testament, there is no other scriptural text in any other religion that professes the incarnation, that speaks about Christ becoming man, that speaks about his ministry, that speaks about his passion, death, and resurrection. No other religion speaks about that at all. In this survey, the, the statement was, all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are equally true. Yeah. So this is getting at this idea that, well, ultimately we all believe the same things in the end, don't we? It's basically a golden rule, faith, uh, do unto others as you would have done unto you. We all kind of agree with that, right? It's, that, that is what we might call a basic ethic, but it is not revealed truth. But it is found in various religions, but that is not what Christianity is about. The golden rule is not what Christianity professes. And so in this survey, 54% of Roman Catholics agreed with that statement, 57% of mainline Protestants, and 20% of evangelicals agreed with that statement that all religions are equally true. Taking a moment out of this conversation to tell you about the Bible course. Because whether you're a seasoned Bible reader or you're just starting on your journey, the Bible course offers a superb overview of the world's best-selling book. This eight-session course is going to help you grow in your understanding of the Bible. Using a unique storyline, the Bible course shows you how key events, books, and characters all fit together. It's great for in-person groups or digital gatherings. It can be used anywhere. Watch the first session for free and review the accompanying course guide. Go to biblecourse.ca to learn more. That's biblecourse.ca. And as always, the link is down in the show notes. This is so puzzling to me because the books are different. The practices are different. Reverend Sterling, what has mm. happened? Mm -hmm. That we can have such diverse uh, statements and yet, yet for people to think that's all the same. Yeah. There's nothing similar in Islam and Christianity when you put together the structure of it. How can people be, what's happened here? Yeah, uh, well I think there are two or three things that have happened here, Lorna. Um, the first is, let me just say, I have been very engaged in interfaith dialogue for many years. Um, and um, both have, and, Yeah, both Andrew and I, both uh, we both have. And so we have respect for, um, and we have um, a great deal of admiration uh, for other religious leaders um, of other denominations. And for me to be able to speak at a, in a Jewish synagogue or to have friends who are Muslim imams and teachers, um, is, is a perfectly wonderful thing. And the opportunity, even in those dialogues though, uh, to talk about Jesus um, and for me to talk freely about Jesus. And ironically, I have never had any sort of rejection from any religious leaders whenever I have invoked the name of Jesus. I've never had that. And knowing what I believe of that Jesus to be, who, who that Jesus to be. So there is, I think, sometimes though, Lorna, a misunderstanding amongst some Christians and quite a significant number that that means that having that respectful dialogue implies that all the teachings are therefore equal. And while there is a commonality in certain things that you can definitely see in, in particularly the monotheistic religions, there is, there is some degree of, of, of similarity. The differences are enormous and the difference of the person of Christ is, is the central one. And who is this Jesus? But I think they misunderstand. And I think a lot of Christians misunderstand and have not read perhaps the scriptures as they ought, I might say, Lorna, to be able to have that conversation with people of other faiths. The second thing is that I think the zeitgeist to the spirit of the age is very much one that wants this form of, and the term would be syncretism. It would be trying to level everything out yeah. so you have sort of a level playing field for everything. Now that is neither fair of, or respectful of, of Judaism or Islam or, or Buddhism as it is Christianity. It is not. It, it reduces everything to sort of a common denominator. 
And it is disrespectful of history, it is disrespectful of culture, it is disrespectful of worship traditions. Um, but it is one that is very much inculcated mm -hmm. in the spirit of the age. You see it in the media, you see us bombarded with it. I talk to young teenagers a lot, and I know Andrew does too. Talking to young teenagers, they will immediately jump, they will immediately jump to that question uh, as one of the first questions that they wrestle with mm -hmm. in terms of, are, is, uh, is everyone equal? Are we all the same? Is there nothing distinct about Christianity? What I'm finding though, amongst young Christians, and we can get to this maybe a little later on, what I'm finding about those who are committed young Christians now are indeed very much committed to Christ. Um, and even in their dialogue and their discussion with people of other faiths. But slightly older you get, in a sense, that's when the watering down happens and the syncretism happens because we think that's going to bring peace and harmony and make us good citizens. <laughs> I, I, there is quite a marked departure from the essentials of the faith as the Canadian population ages. And this is, this is, you know, Andrew has really hit the nail on the head here. I think we live in a very pluralist society, increasingly more religiously diverse. Yeah. And so it's this idea, I have to be able to get along yeah. with my neighbors, my co-workers, my fellow students, maybe members of my family. So therefore, I'm just going to hold back a little bit even talking about my faith, let alone professing it in its fullness. Because the idea within a relativistic society where all truths are equally valid. Again, I say truths, which is a, a nonsense, but truths. If I then step into that space and I say, well, no, I believe that Jesus Christ is the fullness of truth and that my Catholic Christian faith is the fullness of truth. And it's not just the fullness of truth for me, it's the fullness of truth for you. Well, that gets received, I think people perceive it as somehow violent, like you're being violent to someone else's view. But in my experience, like Andrew's, when I engage with people who are also religious, faithfully religious from other religious traditions, they want you as a Christian to be authentic. They want to know what you believe. Yeah. And there's a, 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 a well-known story that's, I think, circulated in, in the Orthodox world a little bit about Dr. Peter Buteneff who um, I think he still teaches at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary in, in New York, just outside of New York City, near Yonkers. And he was invited to go in to uh, a synagogue in Manhattan as part of a series they were having on different faiths. And so he was invited to go in as an Orthodox Christian to speak about his faith. And as he, he addressed the people in that synagogue, and he introduced who he was, and he said, I believe you know, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the promised Messiah, he is the fulfillment of the law, the covenants, and the prophets. And I believe that to be objectively and universally true. And I believe it to be true for all of you. To a, to a sea of, of Jewish faces. And then he began to unpack that. And then he said that afterwards the reaction was, the people of that Jewish community came up to him and said, Thank you. Thank you for telling us what you believe. We've had Christians who have come in here before. We had no idea what they believed. But you've been honest with us. Yes. And so, as to Andrew's point, when you are honest about what you believe as a Christian, you are showing respect not only for what you believe and to have an integrity in that and an authenticity, but you're respecting the people you're talking yeah, to. Absolutely. But I think what's yeah. happened is I read the survey results. I felt like this is what happens when we are so religiously phobic. Like we are afraid to actually put on the table because we've put the value of wanting to be a loving, kind person mm -hmm. ahead of who we actually are shaped as, as Christians. Mm -hmm. Lorna, right. to, that, to that effect, I mean, another example was when I was involved in dialogue with the Jewish community on behalf of the United Church of Canada. And it was a very, very good engagement that we had. And I remember a rabbi friend of mine who was part of the discussion, uh, even though we were forming our statement 
on Christian-Jewish relationships. We invited a rabbi to participate. And he, he took me to one side. And he said, Andrew, he said, you know, read your scriptures. Um, be true to your scriptures. Um, look at the book of Romans, you know. A rabbi um, still yes, look at the he book said, He said to me, you, you look at the book of Romans. You tell me what you actually really believe about the inviolability of the covenant of God with Israel and things of this nature. And he said, you know, don't water it down to try and please me. I'm okay. I can take it if you want to quote the Apostle Paul to me. I am fine with that, right? <laughs> I can deal with the book of Romans. I can go home and read it again on my own, uh, said Roy. It was beautiful. And he said, but don't dither around and try and say things that you don't mean. Mm. Because we've had people over the years throughout history have told us what they don't really believe and mean. And then they put us in gas chambers. Wow. Wow. And these types of conversations, these honest types of conversations, are what is going to enable our, our pluralism within society to be truly rich and a, and a vibrant sort of pluralism where you can agree to differ on things. I had a very similar experience with a, an Orthodox rabbi friend of mine. And we were having a beer together. Beer is almost always kosher for your, your, <laughs> the watchers here. Good to know. Uh, so we sat down and he asked me a very interesting question. It was close to Christmas, and he said, so tell me, who is John the Baptist? And I thought, how do I answer an Orthodox rabbi who knows the scriptures? How do I answer that question? And so I thought about it for a minute, and I said, well, John the Baptist is the greatest and last of the prophets. And he said, oh, I never, I've never heard that before. And I said, if you think about what the prophet Isaiah speaks about a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, that's how we understand John the Baptist. And he said, oh, that's so interesting. And that led to a wonderful conversation about the understanding of prophecy in Judaism and Christianity. And so those types of conversations where you get down to the meat of what you actually believe mm. are the ones where the Holy Spirit is most fully present, not where we dither mm -hmm. about what we believe and we, ha we, we display or we, we evince a lack of honesty or integrity because people can see that very quickly. Let's touch on, um, this is a difficult one if we were trying to work on the good neighbor thing which seems to be having shaped Canadian Christians of not wanting to, to bump up against any edges that I might be different, my beliefs might be different. This is on the moral teachings now, mm -hmm. that the Christian's moral teachings should evolve with society's attitudes. This was a key question in the survey. Mm -hmm. And um, there is not a high adherence that Christian moral teachings should be a static thing. This is also, again, very concerning. It's this idea that somehow moral teachings can be divorced from what you believe in your, in your Christian faith. So... Our moral teachings do not exist as something separate from the Holy Scriptures or from tradition. If you believe in the Incarnation, that God took on human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, and if you believe in the Resurrection, that necessarily means you are going to advance and adhere to certain moral teachings. But I think one of the biggest challenges again, it comes back to, to relativism and our pluralist society, is that we need to be nice. <laughs> and so if society is going we in do, one direction, we, yeah. we need to kind of go along with that in order to be charitable and kind and so forth. And so when you look at teachings, for example, especially let's say around euthanasia, where the understanding of dignity, which is our human dignity is found through the incarnation, we have human dignity because we have the image and likeness of God impressed upon us. But then when society disorders that understanding of dignity, that you can somehow lose your dignity, and if you lose your dignity because your external propriety is somehow lacking in your eyes, then you can be killed. And I think for a lot of Christian denominations, they think, well, maybe we need to be more understanding and we need to be more caring about end of life and so forth, and maybe if this is now legal in the country, we need to kind of go along with it. And so these are very different, difficult challenges. But I think at the root of it is we need to be able to help people in the pews um, connect the dots. If I confess this in the creed, how then do I understand what my life 
is going to be in light of that confession. How am I going to relate to the struggles, the pains, the sufferings, the joys, the hopes that I have in my life if I can't look back and understand that they are informed by my Christian belief? And, and you, let's make this very practical. You are going to be approached. How are you going to answer that, Reverend Andrew? How are you going to answer that question of, will you come to my maid bedside, my medical assistance in dying bedside? Can you come join our family? It's happening, it's happening in every congregation. Well, I mean, the, the, the church has a very, the Catholic church has a very strict teaching on this. You, uh, certainly as a cleric, I can have no role in that whatsoever. I can counsel people. But that, even now, that is much, dif it's very difficult to do that within a hospital setting because you're seen as interfering in someone's autonomy. You're seen as interfering in someone's free choice if you even hint at their conscience and that they should think through this and so forth. That's, it's becoming very, very challenging for chaplains in hospitals. It's difficult. Uh, for faithful uh, Christian, Orthodox Jewish, faithful Muslim doctors, nurse practitioners, and so forth. But I think the, the, the message has to be that because of the incarnation, because of the resurrection, you bear this dignity that cannot be erased. And then it, it comes to having a proper ordered understanding of suffering. Yes, suffering is hard. Suffering is very hard. And none of us like to see people suffer. None of us like to see our loved ones suffer or to experience suffering ourselves. But how do we understand suffering in light of the resurrection? What does suffering bring about in terms of the call to virtue and to, to perseverance, to patience, to long suffering? What role does that have in strengthening community, the community between people, our human community, our faith community, our Christian community? So these conversations are happening, but often they're stifled because there are limited spaces in which they can take place now. And mm. Uh, mm. the palliative stage is not the right time either. Those, those conversations have to happen. I think, Lorna, too, there is a, a, I ask the question um, about not only that single issue made, for example, but all of these ethical decisions that we're having to make. Uh, what should the Christian approach be and what informs the Christian in the decisions that they have to make. Because let's face it, a lot of these are like being faced with the Scylla and Charybdis. I mean, you, you're torn on both sides. Um, you're torn by the desire to be compassionate and in a sense, the spirit of the age saying, you know, the, that is the compassionate thing to do is to end the suffering of others. That, that's what you're supposed to do. For me, essential to all of this is the way that we do our theological reasoning and our moral reasoning born out of that. And here is where, and I know I'm speaking biasly from the point of view of the Canadian Bible Society, I think one needs to, if you're a Christian and you're dealing with these things, honestly seek the scriptures, honestly go to the depths of the scriptures, be knowledgeable, be informed, and understand that. And that in Christ there is, as the book of Colossians says, the pleroma, the fullness of God dwells. So go, in a sense, to this very God. But that also brings up another dimension, not only the scriptures, but also and comes out in this, the importance of, of prayer and the personal, and I'm stressing that, the personal power of the Holy Spirit guiding us and strengthening us. What's happened is, especially since the 1960s, where you had what they call a thing called situational ethics, where the situation you know, determines how you respond and therefore you can respond differently um, in each situation that you find yourself in. This was a really big movement and it had a profound impact on the church. Um, in response to that, it seems to me that, that true faithfulness and fidelity ourselves to God in Christ is required. 
um, that in our moral reasoning and in our thinking, there is a place for scripture, uh, there is a place for prayer and deep devotion and honestly seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the redemptive power of the Holy Spirit to in fact move our hearts and our minds in how we actually operate. If we think, Lorna, that the Holy Spirit is nothing more than just an energy that is out there or a power that is out there, rather than being the very personhood of God, who comes and dwells within us and changes us from within and inspires us and teaches us and illuminates scripture. If we don't believe in that personal Holy Spirit, then again, we're just left with this very facile situational ethic where we just kind of reason our way through it on our own and then make that decision rather than seeking the will and the hand of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think historically also, Lorna, if we look at this question, you know, that, that somehow Christian moral teaching should change or evolve with society's attitudes, if that had been the case in the first few centuries of the church's history, then would we have just gone along with what Romans were doing, exposing their children on the hillside, treating their slaves abominably? The church said, no, this is what is the truth about the human person. And so we are going to behave differently as our Lord Jesus Christ calls us to behave. And so I wonder if these numbers would be different if over the last number of decades, churches across the country had been, dare I say it, a bit more courageous in challenging some of the directions that our institutions, our public institutions have been taking, being more courageous in establishing more centers for palliative care, more centers uh, that bring a Christian understanding to health care. Um, would these numbers be different if we were very up front in presenting a different understanding of the human person from what secular society is promoting. And I think now there's really, if there's one thing we can learn from these numbers, now is the moment for the churches in this country to take an even stronger stand in offering a different approach, an approach that is infused with uh, Christian tradition, with what our Lord would have us do, and to do it in a way that responds to the needs of the people. And I think, uh, again, these, these numbers offer us uh, an opportunity for reflection on those questions. Thank you. I, and I, I think we should close at this moment, uh, Reverend Sterling, with this is the role of the Bible Society, mm. is to bring the truth of the Scripture into where we live in this day. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the marching orders, do you think, from the <laughs> results of this study? Well, there are two or three key ones for me, Lorna. Um, I actually still believe, and maybe I'm a dinosaur or something, but I still believe in the efficacy of preaching and proclamation. And one of the things that we are doing with the Canadian Bible Society is working with pastors and preachers across the country, coast to coast to coast, um, in working on how to preach more biblically. Um, I think, let's be honest, um, Christians are not exposed for very long on a weekly basis to the hearing of the word. <clears throat> um, and uh, many of them reduce their, their, their knowledge of the word to what they hear and see within the context of worship. And so I've been saying for a long time, and the Bible Society is with me on this. Yes, and we have the study, the results. The study, the we results have the results for Bible preachers Bible. to preach more biblically in order that people might actually know what the scriptures actually says and to proclaim it with passion. I also, so we're doing that with the Canadian Bible Society. The other thing that we're doing with the Bible Society is really reaching out to those who are at times on the periphery of the church or might not be part of the main focus. And I'm speaking here about two groups. One are new Christians and the other ones who are Christians who have come from foreign lands where they have had to fight and live and struggle for their identity of their faith, have faced persecution for that very faith, and we are putting Bibles in their hands. We're doing everything in our power to make the scriptures available to people. 
And this, I think, is a vital cause. It's what brought me into the Bible Society. I went from the pulpit to the Bible Society for the very purpose of saying, I know even my own weakness, and I should start to correct this in myself, but I should try and get the inspiration of the preaching of the Word. And also, in a sense, um, in a sense, this is a little bit of an indictment on the catechetical work of the church, the teaching of the church. Maybe we haven't done our best. The Canadian Bible Society at least is producing resources uh, for young families, for young children, for people who are in prison, uh, for those who are experiencing stress in their lives um, and grief. Uh, We are providing a means for them to engage the scriptures um, in whatever state of, of life that they are in. Um, If we can do that and help with catechesis, if we can help with the proclamation of the gospel, if we can share it in the language of people so they can read it and make it accessible, then I think there is a sign of hope. And I do want to hold out this hope here. Um, I don't believe that every generation is like every generation that preceded it. And what we do now, Lorna, and this is really the clarion call, what we do now in this generation will determine the Christian faith in this country and beyond for generations to come. It is always dependent on each generation to share the faith and to pass it on to the next generation. This is a biblical mandate. It is a mandate from Holy Scripture. It is there in the Old Testament. It is there in the New Testament. We pass that faith on. And if we can do that, and if young people, as you'd mentioned, are going to have themselves a sense of the importance of the Christian faith, then Lorna, I believe there is hope. Still Christian. What Canadian Christians believe about their faith. Thank you both, gentlemen, for taking us through it. Uh, the links to it are available at the bottom of this podcast. Uh, they, uh, they are a clarion call, as you say, to be people of the Bible who believe it fully. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you.